Hi, good, e good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, David McGuffin's Travel Talk Tuesday. This is our uh, ninth edition, I think, and tonight we're talking about Florence, Italy. We're uh, just trying to get our Facebook live stream up and going, and uh, but we've got a great show planned for you. And <clears throat> just a little introduction, you know, Florence, Italy is, um, gosh, I, I went there in 1977 for the very first time as a, as a kid in a choir. Uh, I was, I wasn't a teenager. I was 20, 21 years old, something like that. And I just fell in love with the place and have been going back ever since. But uh, historically speaking, it's, uh, it's a significant destination because it kicks the, the whole world of history out of uh, the Middle Ages and into a new beginning or a renaissance. And this family that uh, were the rulers at the time, the Medici family, were instrumental in giving money and fostering art and literature and learned situations going on all over the city and architecture. So that's what we're gonna really be talking about tonight. Um, I'm gonna kick on a little uh, video here to get us going so you'll get an introduction to Florence. And as I mentioned, it was um, my first time there when I was in 1977. So uh, we're, I'm also looking over here on Facebook Live and I appreciate Deborah. Deborah, oh, we were there together. Debbie Baker, we were there together. So uh, that's, that's fantastic. I, you might see yourself show up in some pictures, who knows? Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, let me share this screen and, and get going with this. Okay, so that's me on top of the cupola, the Dome of Florence, the Duomo by Brunelleschi in 1977. A bit younger and thinner back then. I still have a beard though. come back full screen. And um, mention to you that, you know, Florence is in the very center of Italy. If you think about all of Europe, Italy is a big peninsula sticking down into the Mediterranean Sea. And Florence is about halfway down from the Alps in Switzerland and Northern Italy to Sicily, which is an island beyond uh, beyond the, the toe of what we call the Italian boot. And the region that uh, Florence is in is called Tuscany or Tuscano. And uh, so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And I mentioned earlier that the significant thing about Florence is that it was a medieval city. And uh, just to kind of recap the history of, uh, of the world at that time, or at least of uh, the Western civilization. We know that uh, the Roman Empire kind of took over from the fifth century BC to the fifth century AD. There was a fall of the Roman Empire. There was a, uh, a resurgence of uh, Christianity in the church and that brought on the Middle Ages and a lot of uh, little city states popped up all over Italy and all over Europe. And so during that time, so we say from 500 AD 
to about 1450 AD, so a period of almost a thousand years, is what we call the Middle Ages. And there was the early Middle Ages, the Middle Ages, and the High Middle Ages. And uh, so, but at that time, what really happened is the folks were just surviving. There was no learning going on, no art, no education, no reading, no writing. That only happened within the church. And um, so it, it became, people were just scratching out a living. And then in Florence, along about 1450, there was this uh, aristocracy family named the Medici family. And under the rule of uh, Cosimo I, and then Lorenzo the Magnificent, they began to reach back to the knowledge that they recalled people talking about and writing about from the Greek era, which, and the Roman era, which was uh, a thousand years beforehand. And so Lorenzo the Magnificent and Cosimo the, the first and second began to give money to these artisans to, uh, produce art, produce sculpture, produce architecture, to write. And this is when uh, it was a new renaissance, a new beginning. And so that's where we're talking about right now. So on, on these things, I've kind of decided to uh, listen to what you guys have been talking about. So my travel talk Tuesdays have also kind of morphed into a little cooking uh, or at least a recipe of something when we uh, are going through this. So tonight is my pizza recipe. And my pizza recipe is a Tuscan pizza recipe. So I wanna play for you uh, my, my pre-recorded preparation for making my uh, pizza dough and how to do that using all natural ingredients. And then uh, as we move through the rest of the evening, I'm going to uh, roll out the dough, put on the toppings and bake it. Uh, so here, let me let me see if I can get to going with that on sharing you how I made the the pizza dough. Uh, on Zoom, I see a few people joining in. I hadn't seen it in a while. So Dave Davis, good Hi, to, Dave good to see your face here. or not your face, but your name to there. Prepare my menu for my episode tonight of Travel Talk Tuesday, and it's my homemade pizza dough and uh, fresh baked um, pizza in the oven. So let me show you the ingredients before we get going. All of these ingredients can be bought at your local supermarket. So I start first of all with this bread flour. Now I use bread flour because as you can see it's 12.7% gluten, which it makes the bread, makes the pizza dough kind of uh, fluff up and be puffy and chewy, which is the texture of the pizza dough we usually get in Florence or in Italy. And then all purpose flour. So here, it's about uh, two thirds of the bread flour and one third of all purpose flour. Now I use grams, so I'm going um, 400 grams of the bread flour, 200 grams of the all purpose flour. Now, if you want to translate that to cups, let me get my notes here. And basically it's about three cups of bread flour to one and a half cups of all purpose flour. Following that, I have about a half a cup of olive oil, a teaspoon or a tablespoon of salt, and a tablespoon of sugar. We have all purpose yeast, which I'll dissolve in this uh, water, and that's almost two cups of water. And I'll combine all of that, those ingredients together into my KitchenAid mixer over here to prepare the dough. So the first thing I'll do is uh, take the yeast and dissolve it into this water. With this rapid yeast, it says it's not necessary to do that, but this is how I was instructed to do it in Italy. So I'll let that kind of dissolve just a little bit. And then I'll begin putting the dry ingredients into this. So this is the bread flour. grams of all-purpose flour. I'll get that going. On about speed number two. Add the uh, tablespoon of salt, the tablespoon of sugar. <coughs> and next to a half cup of olive oil. Just kind of incorporate that into the dough. 
And then finally, the warm water and yeast. That's about two cups of warm water and a pack of yeast. So I'll let that blend into a nice ball of dough. It'll take about three or four minutes and then set the dough aside for a couple hours to let it rise. So this dough has been going for about oh, maybe four minutes or so. That's what we could take to the idea now. It's ultimately going to rise and get thicker than this. But right now, it's a little, little gooey and gummy. Which is what we're doing. I'm going to uh, take the little hook out, straight the sides, and then cover it with a chicken powder. And let it sit for some time. Scrape it down, a little spatula. Now put a kitchen towel over it and don't touch it for a couple of hours. In the meantime, over here in this area on my stove, I've already uh, prepared the ingredients for the topping of the pizza. The first element is my uh, homemade red tomato sauce which you'll we'll have to save that for another episode because it's simple and it's just a proven recipe that works for anything that you're looking for, for a uh, marinara or tomato sauce. And then of course we have sliced mushrooms over here, pepperoni, onions, uh, mozzarella cheese, red bell pepper, and then I've got a little sun-dried tomato as well, just to add a little extra flavor on the pizza. So that's it for the pre-prepared part in the kitchen. We'll uh, reconvene here with cooking it in the stove in our range of uh, here uh, later on this evening. Okay, I've got the dough. It's been two hours here and I've been covered. Here's what it looks like at the moment. So I'm going to put some flour here on the counter and pull it out on that. Knead it a little bit. But you can see that it's, it's very, very doughy. It's not like bread dough. So and this is because of the high gluten bread flour that I've used, which gives that the pizza dough a little extra chewy crust once it's baked. See how stretchy it is. So put it out here like this, work it a little bit, turn it over on itself a couple of times. I gotta reach in and do a little more flour here, put some more start with. Turn it on itself. There's a lot of heat being generated by the uh, the yeast and it rising. And you can see how I just I've done this. Just kind of turn it in on itself, tuck it in, let it sit there. This time I'll let it sit there on the counter for maybe 15, 20 minutes, divide it in half and then it'll be ready to roll out for the pizza. Okay, so that's really it. Okay, I've uh, separated the dough into two balls. It'll make about two 16, 18 inch pizzas. And uh, so they're ready to go. All I'll need to do is roll them out with a rolling pin and uh, top them with the ingredients and put them in the oven. So we'll do that as we progress through this evening with Travel Talk Tuesday. I'm going to rewind that because you didn't get to see the this beginning. This is the Florence American Cemetery and Memorial in Tuscany. This cemetery holds the remains of just about 4,400 young men who gave the ultimate sacrifice that of their lives to their country. They fell in battle here in Italy in June of 1944.
Okay, I think I might be back back full screen now. And uh, I just wanted to, to share that with you for a moment as well. Uh, so first of all, going back to the, the dough, the pizza dough and everything else, you've seen what I've done there. And um, so I, during that time, uh, we've tried to shoot the camera over here with me um, preparing the dough a little bit. And so this is here, I'll bring it over here, like a pizza oli which is what the pizza pizza guy is that's actually trained in Italy. So I'll, I'll have the dough here and stretch it out. So I've got two, two of these pieces of dough going with what I've made today. And then let me talk to you just a second about the American Cemetery because uh, it's, it's a place that's often overlooked. Um, it was probably not until I'd been to Florence for about 15 years that I first went to the American Cemetery in Florence. And really, I should have known about it, but I didn't. And we were traveling up from, um, from Siena to Florence on our bus. And uh, a person on the bus who happened to be a, uh, a former uh, Navy captain looked over and saw a bunch of crosses over on the, the left hand side of the, the right hand side of the bus and said that's an american cemetery over there and so i had my driver uh he was from the netherlands so he wasn't familiar with this as well and so the next exit we pulled off navigated back uh went out of the way through this little chianti classico region and went to the american cemetery in florence and um, if you just think back in history, just a second, uh, I know a lot of times I just skirt through dates and whatnot, but uh, it's important to realize that uh, during World War II, in June of 1943, uh, the Isle, there was an Allied invasion to Sicily, and which is just an island right below uh, the peninsula of the Italian boot. Sicily at the time was, or and still is, a part of Italy. but the Allied troops came in, began to uh, make their way through Sicily, conquered Sicily, and then by another year later had made it up halfway up the boot of the peninsula of Italy, what we know. And, they, and so the folks, the, the young men and three women that are buried here at the Florence American Cemetery, a little over 4,400 of them, uh, lost their lives defending um, our nation and our allies against uh, Hitler and Mussolini and their troops and uh, liberating uh, the Italian peninsula on their way up. And so it's just a, a fantastic place to go. And it's just the same sort of thing on any American cemetery that I've been to, whether it be in Normandy or Belgium or whatever, but it just uh, gives you chance to think and to look at those crosses with uh, young men and women's names on them and when they, they perished in battle. And uh, if they were not uh, Christian, if they were Jewish, there's a Star David as well that marks the tombstone. So just a, a great place to go. So if you haven't been to Florence uh, with me or if you go with someone else, uh, it's only five miles south of town, easy to get to and uh, it deserves uh, an opportunity to go there. So uh, that's the Florence American Cemetery. And now we're gonna go to Florence proper, I think. Uh, I'm gonna play a little bit of this video that we prepared and then uh, stop it, uh, give you some more instruction on how I prepare my pizza and then finish up my, my videos in Florence. ago and we were actually driving from Volterra up to Florence and I decided to go a little bit off the beach. Uh, uh, let me caveat here and mention to you that uh, every week I say several years back in, 19, in 2014 I made a video of my best of Italy tour going from Rome up to Tuscany, the Cinque Terre, uh, Venice, Lake Como and Milan. And uh, so we chronicled the entire tour with, uh, with only three or four people 
uh, tag it, tagging along to help us out as extras on the video. And so it is a great experience with those, those folks. And uh, so this is uh, how this is made. And my, my friend, Abby Whitaker, is the videographer and the editor on this. And she's done a fantastic job piecing it all together. Uh, so we had a uh, wine uh, tasting experience a couple of days before in Volterra, and one of the wines was a Chianti Classico wine. So I thought, we well, you know, since we're driving up there, why drive on the highway? Let's go on the small road, the Chianti Road, and we'll drive to the Chianti region. We went off really off the beaten path because I got off the paved road even, and we went on this dirt road way up the hills, up through the vineyards. I see, I was just looking here at the folks on uh, on the Zoom, the live Zoom call, and I see Marsha. Marsha, good to see you, and uh, you and Larry, greetings to you guys in Texas, and, uh, you know, we've experienced some of these things together as well. In fact, great news. <laughs> Thanks, Marsha. And then, uh, we're on our way all to Florence. Up above Florence, there are two opportunities to see a cityscape scenic overview. One of them is where all the tourists go to Piazzale Michelangelo. I really like to venture a little further up beyond the Piazzale Michelangelo and visit the church on the hill called San Miniato al Monte. From there, it's quiet. There's maybe 20 people or so up there. And you have another grand, fantastic view and overlook of the city without all the uh, above of tourists and uh, buses and cars and everything going by. Trip Florence, I like to make a pilgrimage up to this grand viewpoint at San Miniato Church. It doesn't get much better than this. A medieval church, six o'clock mass in the background, almost sunset, small few crowds, and Brunelleschi's dome in the distance. I'm gonna stop it there because um, this is one of my most favorite places to go in Florence. You know, up until COVID-19 struck and um, all tourism was shut down, uh, if you went to Florence, it was one of the most crowded cities in Europe and everybody was on this one, one road that led from the old bridge, the Ponte Vecchio to the uh, Piazza Signoria, uh, which is where the Medici Palace is where I showed you where the, the, the fizzy water fountain was. And uh, then going down to the Duomo, where this dome of uh, Brunelleschi's dome is there. And then there are two museums, the museum, uh, the Academia Museum, which has the Statue of David, which you'll see in a moment. And then also the Uffizi Gallery, the offices of the Medici family, which has now been converted into an art museum, uh, the most famous, um, uh, paintings in the world of Renaissance art from, from Italy. And uh, so those are the main tourist attractions, but you don't find any tourist where we are right now on uh, San, San Miniato Amante. This church was uh, first established up there in, the, in the, like the 11th century. And this saint, uh, Saint Miniato was from Armenia. That's the Italian name of the saint. And supposedly he was a, a, a centurion in the Roman uh, army. And uh, he accepted Christianity as his religion and just walked away from the army and went to be a hermit. And the uh, centurion and the emperor at the time searched him out and found him hiding in the hills near Florence. 
and they took him to this um, uh, Roman theater, or uh, actually an amphitheater, kind of like the Colosseum, which is located in Florence up on a hill on the other side of the, the Arno River from where we are in San Miniato. And they took him up there into the uh, amphitheater and uh, put him in the center and they put a panther out there to come and devour him and he had to fight the panther. Well, the panther decided that uh, he wasn't gonna fight the Christian Miniato. And so therefore, uh, the, the, the ruler, the emperor who happened to be there at the time said, well, off with his head anyway. So they cut his head off. And so St. Miniato picked up his head walked down to the city of Florence, walked across the Arno River and up this hill to where this church is called San Miniato on the mountain. And this is where he was laid to rest. And this church was built, like I say, in the 11th century for him. And it's been inhabited as a church ever since. It's one of the most beautiful uh, Romanesque churches in all of Italy. And it's dedicated to this saint who has done that. Um, so, Take it or leave it, whatever you believe, but that's the story that goes behind it. But it's a fantastic view from up here. And you get up there with only uh, 15 or 20 people. They have a mask uh, right before dusk. And it's, it's just a beautiful place to go up there. So I've talked enough about it. You want to go there sometime if you've never been there. Florence metro area is quite large, but if you just can, uh, concentrate on the historic city center, you actually could walk from the Arno to, say, the Academia, which are the two extremes of things you want to see, probably in just strolling in 30 minutes. Walking at uh, David McGuffin pace, okay. you could do it at 15, but uh, you don't really want to do that. But uh, So it's very compact, and that's why I, uh, I really, really enjoy being in Florence. Okay, I'm going to stop it here because I got to get this pizza going. Um, I, I wanted to show you if I could get uh, Leslie to jerk, to move the camera around to a couple of things. First of all, we got a typical Tuscan antipasti. Um, maybe I can just bring it over here. Okay. We were going to have a camera tethered with, by a, a cord, but it didn't really work. Uh, so let me just show you what we got going here. Tuscan antipasti of, uh, of a couple of types of cheeses, a sheep cheese called pecorino, and uh, of course, uh, this cheese here is Parmesan cheese. We got several types of salami, and then we have quite a few selections of, um, of um, peppers. Gosh, I can't see how to do this. Peppers and, uh, and olives that are here. So those are, that's our antipasti, what we're going to have before our pizza. Uh, so we're kind of nibbling on that as we go along tonight. So forgive me, forgive me for being long-winded. Also having some good sparkling water and a little bit of a good Chianti Classio wine from the region just south of F. Florence, right there where that American cemetery was. Let me put this down and then I'll, uh, we'll look at the pizza real quick and see how to assemble that. So, pizza dough is all set up over here. I'm just going to roll it out. I, I, my space is kind of limited here. Usually I do it on a much larger surface, but just for the sake of uh, getting this going, roll the dough out. And then I do use a, a pizza board, but I cheat and put some parchment paper on it. In Italy, they put a little cornmeal on it so it, it doesn't stick, but I'm gonna put the parchment paper on it, put it over here, roll it out so it's a little bit rounded, more rounded. Boy, 
Boy, this dough is really pliable now. And then I take my ingredients. This homemade tomato sauce, which I'll show you one other day how to do it. Kind of. It's, it's got onions in it, no garlic, so my good Italian friends say you never mix onion and garlic together. It's either one or the other, so this one has onion in it. So onion, fresh tomatoes, uh, and, or here canned tomatoes, but fresh from Italy. And some spices like basil and oregano. So that's, that's that. Now I have a mixture of uh, bell peppers, pepperoni, mozzarella cheese, onions. So I'll put that on there. I'll go with the peppers first. Just kind of spread them out. I got the oven already preheated to 425. And I have a pizza stone in there. I wish I had a pizza oven. I do have a plan for one of those to build one day. But I've got too many other projects going on right now. So I'll do that. Onions, I'm not chopping them up. I like them. I like big slices of onion. So let's do that. Pepperoni. You know, we have this place here in Florida called Papa Murphy's, which is uh, you can you can order your pizza uncooked and bring it home. And I like that. I don't know the last time I had a Pizza Hut pizza or Papa or any Papa John's or anything like that. But I like that, but this is so much better if you've got the time, but you have to prepare ahead of time in order to do this. So there we go, the pepperoni, mozzarella cheese. Just for the heck of it, I'm gonna put some uh, little sun-dried tomatoes on it. And then pop it in the oven over here for 10 minutes. So I'm gonna start. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start the video again. Pop it in for ten minutes. Here we go. Sorry, I knew that took way too long. Let's go take a look around the uh, leather mark here. It's a great place to go and get uh, goods like some leather goods, coats, belts, shoes, purses. Make sure you barter here because prices are soft and you can talk them down to a certain extent. Let's do it every year. Oh, yeah. He does a good job of uh, showing us all. Yeah. Thousand years. 
It's possible to climb to the dome and bell tower, but they're all step. And it's at least 116 towers more to the top of the dome. But if you get energetic and want to view, just say you already had it yesterday from the Piazzetta Michelangelo, right? On the agenda of every tourist in Florence is to have an opportunity to take a look at uh, Michelangelo's grand statue of David. We use a local guide uh, that I discovered gosh, 15 years ago or so, and her name is Apala, and she has a, puts a wonderful perspective, a wonderful personal perspective on the art that we see. Sorry, you call me with a piece of salami in my mouth. I wanted to stop here because at the very beginning of this, I showed you a, the only photo I have of myself on my first trip to Florence in 1977. And I told you I was standing in this striped shirt at the, the top of the uh, Duomo and um, on the cupola after climbing up inside that dome that Brunelleschi built. And I, I started a journal in, in, I guess, in 1977, but it was a, a notebook just with these pages in it and a six binder notebook. And I wanted to read to you a minute because uh, of, of what I wrote, because I don't even remember this, but this is a very significant place because the palace you see right here on the, the screen the Medici Palace right downtown in the very center of Florence, way up on the top where those lights are, um, right before the bell tower begins, so it's illuminated, is a room called the Council of the 500. And um, it requires, um, yeah, there are stairs that go all the way up there. I mean, it's like seven stories of huge, huge stairs. and. I thought I went up there for the first time about 10 years ago, and this was after the book of uh, Dan, Dan Brown came on, uh, uh, whatever that, I can't remember what it was called, the Dan Brown book that was um, written there in Florence. Um, but and So I thought, well, I'm going to go up there and, and look for these icons on the ceiling, the frescoes on the ceilings and everything. But anyway, here's my journal. It said... Um, 
uh, this is May 16th, 1977. We had been in Siena and San Gimignano, and finally we uh, were getting to our hotel in Florence, which was located way on the outskirts of town near the airport. And I wrote, I had supper, and we went to give a concert at the Palazzo Vecchio, the Medici, Medici Palace, at the Room of the 500, once owned by the Medici family. There were about 100 people to hear us sing and give our concert. And, you know, I should have remembered that. That's a significant event. But I don't. And back in those days, you know, uh, we only had like little instamatic cameras or film cameras where, and of course, no video cameras. And so that it was a very significant event, but that's right there at the top of that, that place. So it's just fantastic that, uh, that I do have a recording of that, although it'd be in my handwriting of doing that. Hey, I'll go on and just tell you because what I, what I did on that trip is my first time ever going to Europe or actually even getting on a plane and going anywhere outside anywhere. So, uh, you know, I, I think I shared with you last week in Rome, but we got to Florence and I was one of those guys who uh, stayed up late at night and I got up real early in the morning and went out and explored. And I wrote with uh, that uh, the next day on the 17th, I woke up at 6.30 a.m., walked around for a while. We had breakfast back at our hotel at eight and at nine we left on a tour to go into town and we went to the Museum of Fine Arts, saw Michelangelo's David, the slaves, and which were some of the most prominent artwork in the town. Uh, then we saw the rape of the Sabine women, which is also there at the Academia, a plaster model of that. And uh, then went to the Church of the Holy Cross where some of the uh, famous Renaissance artists are buried like Dante, Michelangelo, Galileo, Machiavelli, and um, then we went to the Piazzale uh, Michelangelo, which I showed you um, earlier in the church, San Miato Church. We didn't go there, but the Piazzale Michelangelo is right below that. We toured the Pitti Palace, which is a huge palace outside of town of the Medici family. And uh, we had lunch at the square and shop for a while at three o'clock. We went to the Cathedral of Florence called the Santa Maria del Fiore, and it's the third largest cathedral in the world. Here we saw the largest fresco and mosaics of the dome and the many altars. Outside, we saw the baptistry and the bell tower. And then later that afternoon, my friend Doug and I walked up uh, the dome to the cupola, staying for a while. Then we shopped for a while and rode the city bus. Can you believe that in 1977? I'd never even been on a bus before. I was from Middleburg. There's no bus in Middleburg. The city bus back to a hotel by the airport. Anyway, that's how I began my adventures of exploring Europe. Let me finish this up. I know I'm uh, talking way too much. They come in from the day and leave. They just stay the night and you have a leisurely dinner somewhere, and then you come back, say, at uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, walking down the streets of Florence. It's a totally different city. The, the streets are lit up. There's very few people out there. If there are, it's the locals. The shops are still open. And uh, it's a different way to see and explore Florence. And that's why I, uh, I really, really enjoy being in Florence, because you can if you have a hotel right in the city center, which you do, then uh, 10 minutes in any direction, you're right in the heart of it. Well, that's it for the night. My my memories of Florence, and I hopefully uh, didn't wax on too much about it, but uh, it's a favorite city of mine. I could go back there year after year after year. I've got to turn around and look at my oven because I didn't set a timer. And I think I need to take the pizza out. So just one second and then we'll close this thing out. Nope, I got a minute or two left. So the pizza's almost done, but thank you guys for joining in. I, uh, I'm, I'm just, I see the folks on Zoom and we have another 
another uh, feed going on with Facebook Live. So thank you guys for that and for the comments you've made on that as well. But um, that's how I do Florence. I'm just looking forward to the day that we can get back uh, on a plane and go, go somewhere in Europe. Um, my friends in uh, Rome uh, sent me an email today mentioning that the government in Italy, uh, the government of uh, Conti, had collapsed last week. And so now they're kind of in limbo and don't know what's going on. And so uh, the vaccines are on hold and everything else. So we're hoping and praying that things will get a lot better in, in Italy in the coming, the coming weeks and they'll get their government sorted out as well. Um, thank you guys. I'm just looking, glancing over here to all the people on uh, Zoom, which I can see. So thank you so much. Uh, Hey, Larry, it's good to see you there as well. Hey, <laughs> good to see you. Thank you, uh, Dave Davis and Diane. And um, uh, let's see who else is down. Eva, uh, Dave and Janet Ballantyne, uh, Charlotte and Leslie are around here somewhere, kind of holding things together. So they're, they're here watching. Nancy, good to see you too. And uh, you guys on, um, on Facebook too. Deborah was on there earlier and several others. But... That's it for Travel Talk Tuesday next week. We're going to Florence or going to Venice and uh, be floating on the water. So thanks so much. And you guys have a great time. I'm going to show you my pizza and then we're out of here. So Leslie, you can, if you click out of here, I'll need my pizza out of the oven. My pizza's ready, so we're gonna eat that. I wish you could be here to join us. Hey, take care. Buona serata, arrivederci.